Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome um, visitors to King's College London. I'm Professor Evelyn Welsh. I'm the Vice Principal for Arts and Sciences. And it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce tonight's inaugural lecture there and to introduce tonight's inaugurand there. Um, Professor Christoph Meyer studied political science and sociology in Hamburg before completing an MPhil and a PhD in international relations at the University of Cambridge in 2001 with a thesis on towards a European public sphere, the European Commission, the media, and public accountability. He was a visiting researcher at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies and a Marie Curie postdoctoral research fellow at the Center of European Policy Studies, a genuine beneficiary of European mobility there. From January 2007, he was a lecturer at Birkbeck, University of London, and a research associate at the University of Cologne. He also worked, and this is his word, not mine, intermittently in journalism, writing articles for a range of German papers. He came to King's as a lecturer in European studies, and now, five years later, he is head of department of the European International Studies, which was formed in 2011 in the School of Arts and Humanities, and our professor of European and International Studies there. And his main areas of research, as many of you will know, are political communication about risks and threats, European integration and foreign policy making. And when I first thought that, I thought, I suppose interesting risks and threats. If you're on one side, European integration is indeed a risk and a threat. On others, it's an opportunity there. And constructivist approaches in international relations. He won a major grant by the European Research Council to study warnings about violent conflict and is currently involved in a project on the role of the news media in fields of violent conflict the co-chair of an expert task force which studied the European Union's capacity to prevent and stop mass atrocities. Um, and the uh, EU website contains his 2013 report there. He has many important research contributions there. I can just name a few, a 2012 article, Missing the Story, Changes in Foreign News Reporting and Their Implications for Conflict Prevention in Media, War and Conflict, a 2011 edited volume with Chiara De Franco on forecasting, warning and responding to transnational risk, published by Palgrave that same year, and the purpose and pitfalls of constructivist forecasting. Implications of Strategic Culture Research for the European Union's Evolution as a Military Power in International Studies Quarterly. But it's perhaps Christoph's remarkable ability to move between academic research of the highest theoretical concern to the most impactful um, on the ground making a difference, um, which is one of the things that we are most proud of here at King's. I mentioned before, but I'll give it out in, in length. From 2012 to 2013, he was the co-chair of a task force on strengthening e the EU capacities for the prevention of mass atrocities, a report which was delivered in 2013 with talks in Brussels, Budapest, and London. And I don't need to tell this audience, with Syria looming, just how vital that understanding actually is. And now, since 2012, he's been working on a project on improving how to warn, which has been funded by the King's Policy Institute, the department, and the school there. Without wishing to um, lower the tone at all from that remarkable list of achievements, I do need to make sure that I tell you one other bit of important information. The School of Arts and Humanities, as always, has generously funded a reception to follow um, from this inaugural, which will take place in the Great Hall, to which you are all very warmly welcome. But now, can I invite you all to welcome Professor Christoph Meyer to deliver his inaugural lecture on Beyond the Cassandra Syndrome, Understanding the Failure and Success of Warnings. Christoph. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming tonight. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity uh, of uh, giving uh, my inaugural lecture on a project that 
has fascinated me for uh, a number of years now, starting when I uh, arrived at King's, uh, thinking about a uh, project application towards uh, the European Research Council. And um, eight years, or seven years later, this lecture tries to draw upon the fruits of this uh, collective labor um, arising from um, that fund from the European Research Council. And I should say straight away that this fascination and that, uh, that fascination with warnings has been shared not just um, um, by me and, and the audiences that I've been talking to, but also um, the team of researchers that worked with me for uh, three years on the project. I call that the foresight team. Um, John Brante, uh, Chiara De Franco, Florian Otto um, have been working with me on that, on that project. And um, really, without their uh, contribution, I, I, I think I had, I, I, th this lecture would be very short indeed. So um, I, I owe a great um, debt to all three of them for uh, the work uh, we've done together. Now, warnings are not just fascinating to me and um, the, the team of, of, of researchers I've, I've had um, the pleasure to work with, but it is, I think, a, a theme that has uh, fascinated many uh, scholars and indeed um, uh, writers of poetry and, and, and fiction over the years. It, 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 it refers to the notion of uh, a kind of a click, a, 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 a ticking clock, a kind of a sense of missed opportunities to act on, uh, on warnings, a sense that there is uh, a, a tragedy in the making and that fate may play a role in why a warning was not uh, listened to. Had we only listened to this warning in time, we could have prevented this tragedy from unfolding. There's also an element of heroism, the sense that the warning source, the warner, is, uh, is, 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 has to pluck up the courage to speak uh, truth to power. And not just truth to power, um, but also those who are in power to act also have the power to suppress warnings and to ridicule those who uh, uh, want to uh, uh, raise the prospect of a great harm coming to them. So that brings us not just to the element of heroism, but also the elements of the villain. The villain in the piece is usually the decision maker, the one who is ignorant, the one who fails to respond to the warning, the one who suppresses the truth of what is to come, and the one who has to shoulder the blame for not acting. Thirdly, there's an element of redemption, the sense that we can learn from our failures from the next time, the impetus to better ourselves and to overcome our limitations and to uh, put in place mechanisms to learn from our previous mistakes and uh, next time prevent the, the harm from unfolding and next time to listen to the warnings um, when they arise. This is, of course, the connection to social science, because social scientists see the warning response problem as a fascinating puzzle to study. Why and under what conditions are warnings listened to? And are there lessons that we can learn for how we can design warning response systems, how we can communicate warnings better, how we can make sure that preventive policy works in practice? Now, the title of the lecture is the uh, Cassandra Syndrome. And uh, as I've already given you a glimpse here, you've got um, uh, a, a quote uh, from a, uh, a poem from Quintus of Smyrna um, that tries to visualize, try, tries to give an expression of how Cassandra's warning may have looked like. Because in the initial, in the Iliad, and then in the Aeneid, there's actually very little mention of Cassandra and what she actually may have said. But here you get a sense of uh, what she may have said um, to uh, her fellow, her, uh, the, the fellow citizens of Tro Troy when they pulled the uh, horse with the um, soldiers of Greek, Greece um, inside into the city's wall and, and brought about ruin to the city. So she was crying, oh, wretches, into the land of darkness now we are passing. For all round us, full of fire and blood and dismal moan the city is. Everywhere, portents of a calamity gods show. Destruction yawns before your feet. 
fools, you know not your doom. Still, you rejoice with one consent in madness, who to Troy have brought the Argive force where ruin lurks. O oh, ye believe not me, though a near a loud I cry. And on the right, we've got um, a middle-class English woman who painted this picture of Cassandra. You see in the background, uh, very small, well, actually, you can't see it. There's a horse where the, the, uh, the, uh, the soldiers dismount, and uh, the city is burning, and uh, clearly Cassandra is pulling out her hair because no one is listening to her. So she's, she's clearly on the verge of madness again, uh, which doesn't help her credibility um, with uh, those that she's trying to convince. But... Um, um, you, you get your different dimensions of the, the, the warning problem and also different explanations of for why she may not have been listened to. Of course, in the old, uh, uh, in, in, in the original of Homer, uh, Cassandra was cursed. She was given the gift of prophecy, but then when she refused Apollo, uh, Apollo cursed her for being powerless to prevent any of the disasters that she was going to foresee. So whatever she was warning of something, no one would believe her. And even if she wanted to prevent something from occurring herself, she would have been stopped. So a curse might be a good explanation, but there may be other explanations as well why she may have not been uh, listened to at the time, more rational explanations. Where maybe the warning's not specific enough? Where, where she not, was she not clear enough about what was lurking, what kind of ruin was in that, in that horse? Was it because she was pulling out her hair that people thought she's a mad woman? You know, you can't really believe her. Um, so there may be a different types of explanations for why warnings are not listened to, but there's a dominant explanation that is associated with the Cassandra syndrome. And, and that could be summarized in the sense that there are accurate and clear warnings from altruistic warners, but they are bound to be ignored by ignorant, disinterested, or strongly, strongly biased decision makers with no will to act. So there's a dominant explanation, certainly in the popular fiction, but also in many other areas of academic writing that warnings are bound to be ignored and that the blame really lies with the decision maker, with those who have the power to act. In our project, we've been looking specifically at the issue of warning for conflict prevention. And in this field, it is quite clear that this is a dominant explanation, that authors say, um, such as George and Hall said, well, there's timely, timely and accurate warning may not be a problem at all for conflict prevention. Or Bill Zartman, in one of the major studies of missed opportunities, said early warnings were more than adequate and early warning abounds in all of the 30 cases he studied. Uh, he found no problem with warning, only a problem with action. And uh, finally, uh, a P Pulitzer Pl Prize winning book by Samantha Powers, A Problem of Hell, wrote, plenty of good warnings about genocide were available in the US, but senior decision makers, makers were just choosing not to believe. Now, there's an element of truth to these explanations, but what, one of the key arguments I would like to convince you of today is that the Cassandra syndrome is in many ways flawed and that we need to uh, understand how the Cassandra syndrome and our understanding of the role of warners, warning sources and responders of warnings um, hides some of the more complex and difficult uh, uh, problems in understanding the warning response uh, problem how warning sources and recipients are linked and react to each other, and how difficult uh, both warning and preventive action actually is, and under what conditions warnings are actually listened to. So the first problem in our understanding of warnings, and certainly the understanding of warnings in the literature, is that everything seems to appear as a warning, in retrospect, with the benefit of hindsight, and in a, in a climate where uh, people are looking for uh, someone to shoulder the blame for not acting. One of the paradigmatic cases, certainly in the field of conflict prevention, is Rwanda. And there's a, a strong sense in the academic literature of lesson learned, and one of the key lessons learned is that there was plenty of warnings, but they were ignored. However, as one of my uh, um, colleagues has shown in a detailed case study, uh, Florian Otto, um, one of the looking at all the warnings that were available at the time, or alleged warnings, 
including the fa famous fax that um, the UN commander Romeo Dallaire sent to the UN, they were not actually warnings at all, but they were more reports, they were indications, and only in retrospect we tend to understand them as warnings. For instance, the cable that uh, Dallaire sent to the UN, he, in, in which he it seemed to be warning of genocide, when you look more closely, he just conveyed an informant's threat assessment, not Dallaire's personal assessment about what he thought would happen, but unconfirmed allegations of a source. Another case, financial crisis. Um, you may recall uh, uh, Her Majesty the Queen's question to um, academics, if, if this was such a big problem, how come nobody noticed it? Um, when Lehman Brothers collapsed, when it was not bailed out, bailed out and uh, when uh, stock markets on, in, across the world slided. And in this country, there hasn't been a real inquiry into the cause of the financial crisis, but in the US, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Committee did a review, and there was major controversy within that committee about wh whether this crisis was avoidable. They came to the conclusion, the dominant conclusion, that this crisis was avoidable and that, in a sense, everyone was to blame. However, I would argue that in looking at the evidence, there was actually relatively little specific warnings about that particular crisis and how it unfolded. Yes, there were people who saw a bubble and predicted a hard landing, but no one really appreciated the scale of the shadow banking system and the degree of counterparty risk. So the key features of the financial crisis were a surprise to virtually everyone. And only in retrospect, there's a sense that one could blame the rating agencies or uh, regulators or the banks for causing this, this systemic collapse, not taking into account the degree to which all of these actors misunderstood the degree of risk they were taking collectively. This brings us to the de definition of warnings. And indeed, for us, warnings are not just about the knowledge. It's not about the forecast, but they are seen as a communicative act motivated at least in part by the intention to increase the probability of preventive action. A warning typically incorporates two, uh, three main components. There's a knowledge claim about what is likely to happen and when. There's an assessment about the consequences of this forecast, i.e., why should we care about this harm? Why is it important? And thirdly, there's an explicit or, in many cases, implicit judgment about how existing policy is working or not and how it might need to be changed. So what should be done? The second problem with our understanding of warnings is that we have problematic criteria for judging the success of warnings. For instance, in the field of early warning for conflict prevention, there's a sense that warnings have failed if no or only weak preventive action has been taken. This underplays and, and misunderstands the degree to which preventive action itself can fail, can cause more harm than good, the way in which it can pose moral dilemmas by encouraging other actors in other countries to lobby and to, to create uh, uh, an impetus for foreign intervention. So preventive action itself, and depending on the area, is not a good measure of success of warnings. And decision makers can, in a number of cases, be well placed and legitimate to reject any specific recommendation for action because it may create uh, uh, more harm than good. On the other hand, on the other hand of the extreme of measuring warning success is the intelligence community who just thinks that maybe warning is, is just as good as the analysis contained in the warning. So there's a sense that we do the analysis and we um, throw the analysis across the wall to decision makers and what they make out of it is not our concern. So this is the notion of drive-by warnings or over-the-wall warnings. So that um, does not really capture the importance of communicating knowledge in a way that is relevant to decision makers, that is persuasive and that is, that is tied in with their, with their needs of how to take particular decisions with particular instruments. So what we are advocating is a sense of evaluating warnings, not in terms of uh, outcomes on the ground, but in terms of the process that leads to a particular outcome. So within democracies, there has to be space for value judgments and for, political, for, for, for value choices and political judgments. So what matters is not evidence-based policy, but knowledge-sensitive 
policy making in which there's space for these judgments. The third problem is often to un underestimate the extent to which warning and effective warning is difficult. One of the key problems, and that is well understood by the intelligence community, is of course the analysis part. There's huge uncertainty when you try to forecast uh, whether a country will descend into conflict. And uh, major scholars such as Richard Betts say that warning, uh, errors in warning and kind of underwarning are to be expected. They're not a surprise because otherwise you would constantly be overwarning. There would be too many false positives in the warning process. So what an analyst should be aiming for is a good betting average. So somewhere in the middle, 48% they should kind of aim for. So both underwarning and overwarning. So they need to get the analysis uh, as good as well as they can, but they also need to calibrate when to warn and when not to warn. But there are further challenges in the warning process. How do you get the attention of decision makers? Um, particularly top decision makers um, have multiple requests on their time. Um, there are crises happening in the other, other parts of the organization and other policy areas. Um, how do you um, get the decision makers' attention? Secondly, how do you challenge existing beliefs of decision makers? For instance, how do you convince um, your foreign ministry uh, about, for instance, the Georgian uh, conflict that Georgian lead leaders would not be so stupid as to risk a war with Russia, which of course they did in 2008, or to convince uh, regulators that bankers would not be so stupid to take a lot of risks which would bring the institutions down as indeed uh, the Fed believed at the time. And that is one of the main reasons for underestimating the potential for financial crisis. How do you change these conventional beliefs? How do you change uh, the beliefs of uh, decision makers and, 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 and challenge them and provide evidence that, that, that is convincing? But lastly, how do you make the case that action is, is, is both necessary and feasible given the inertia and costs of policymaking? In our research, we came across quite a number of warnings, including warnings from peace-building NGOs and human rights NGOs, warnings from journalists writing open-ad commentaries about uh, a particular situation in the country. And it was quite striking that while many of these warnings were quite strong on the analysis of the conflict or what might happen, they were very weak on saying what can be done and what should be done. There was rather kind of a call that something should be done or there were recommendations that were completely unrealistic. And that devalues the warning from the perspective of decision makers uh, quite substantially. So how do you convince someone that action is both feasible and, and necessary? That doesn't mean, of course, that any attempt to improve warnings and to uh, enhance the prospect for preventive policy are futile and that there is no problem at all. There are a lot of symptoms that we do have a problem in prevention, that there is not enough preventive action occurring. Certainly in the area of conflict prevention, there are studies um, covering a, a, a range of years in the 1990s that show that countries rarely use preventive measures beyond verbal attention and facilitation, and that efforts usually focus on a very small subset of countries where the probability for war is already highest. So in a sense, not the surprising cases, but the cases that everyone expects already. There are also good indications to show that too little money is spent on prevention, and a lot of money is absorbed by crisis management and current operation. So in a sense, prevention is always crowded out by current operation, and uh, there's, no, there's, no, there's not enough, enough uh, resource available for acting in a preventive way. How do we then study the success of warnings? I think one way of, of, of better understanding when warnings can be successful and to make warnings more successful is indeed to stop just looking at cases of failure, as most of the literature does, but also look at cases of success. Now, the problem here is of, is, is, of course, that cases of success in warning are difficult to identify because, by their very definition, preventive action has uh, been effective without someone noticing very often that harm has occurred. So that is difficult from the perspective of research design to identify those cases because they will not feature normally in the news media. Uh, 
Um, in our project, we have looked at cases that were successful at least at some level and that were known to be, or that the case, a public case, has been made for them to be relatively successful. But it was not very easy um, to identify these cases of success. The other challenge is to understand how warners and responders to warnings are linked and how their relationships change over time. So to move beyond a investigation of particular cases towards a more generic assessment of the relationship between warners and responders and how the system as a whole works and evolves over time. So both perspectives are, are necessary. Now what is it that we found? There are three main findings about when warnings are successful in terms of persuading decision makers. The first is really that the credibility of the source is what matters most. So it's, it's less about uh, the warning message, what the, the warning itself says or what kind of evidence is invoked in the warning, but it is about who conveys the warning, who speaks, what is the credibility of the warning source. And we found that the credibility was highest for uh, what we describe as someone from the in-group, a senior official with access, direct access to decision makers. So we came across the case of um, uh, a, a senior official called Andrew Natsios, who uh, was an administrator of the US, uh, US IED, um, the, the kind of development um, agency of the US, and who was warning about uh, impending um, humanitarian catastrophe, some called a genocide in Sudan. In, in, in the 1990s. And he, he, was, he, was, he was exceptionally successful, um, not immediately, but certainly um, uh, after, after further, further lobbying, by giving a briefing to the US deputies, so, so the second highest level um, of the US, uh, US government, so Condoleezza Rice and so forth, um, about what was likely to unfold in Sudan, but also he was able to describe how these consequences did not just matter in terms of humanitarian uh, a, a crisis and humanitarian uh, a civilian lo losses of civilian lives and humanitarian suffering, but he was also able, because he was part, he understood how senior decision makers work and he understood the priorities of the administration to show how this crisis would impact the electoral campaign and would, would potentially affect the re-election chances of the Bush government. So Nazius was a part, was not seen as a kind of the, the, the um, blue-eyed liberal. He was, had a military career, he was a Republican. So he was seen as one of us by the Bush administration. So he was given the access, he understood what the decision makers' priorities were, were, and he was able to frame the warnings in a very effective way. On the other hand, you have, we've come across cases um, such as that of an EU official who can't be named, who um, was very worried about um, the pending war in Georgia in 2008 and sent an email to his superior about what he saw as the, uh, the, the evidence for um, uh, a looming conflict. The problem here was that he was relatively low in the hierarchy. The, the senior official was two levels above him. There was a sense that the commission is a high, very hierarchical body, that you can't actually pick up the phone and call a senior official. Um, which would have been a more effective channel to choose, but all he could do is send off an email. And unsurprisingly, he didn't get any response. When he came back from holiday, the war had already started, and he got these congratulatory emails. Oh, well done, you've, you've forecast this, this really well. But one reason why it was ignored was not just the level of the difference in hierarchy and the organizational culture, but also because uh, he was from a particular country uh, in the Baltics, which was seen as anti-Russian, whereas his superior was from a pro-Russian a pro, pro -Russian country. So there is a sense of bias or perception of bias that someone uh, with his background would say these warnings because he's, he, he, he's part of a certain worldview from the country he originates from. So credibility of the source, uh, a key factor for the explanation of why a warning is being taken seriously or not. The second explanation is uh, late warnings uh, and, and timing matter. So we found that late warnings, perhaps unsurprisingly, had a much higher impact uh, than, than, than early warnings. And there are two reasons for that. One is that decision makers, perhaps in contrast to an area like climate change, think that they can redo the judgment, redo the analysis, duplicate the analysis of the analyst, that they think they can judge the evidence maybe just as good as the analyst. 
So they will draw on their own sources of knowledge, their own indications, they read their own media reports, and if they don't have the indications surrounding the warning, they think it's not credible. So we had uh, examples of uh, a warning passed on from uh, an EU delegation where uh, uh, the respondent said, well, you know, I can't believe this warning, there's nothing on CNN yet. Yeah. So, so there's a sense that um, indications, the kind of the signals surrounding the warning are very important to whether or not it is being uh, uh, received. And media coverage is one of the key ways in which the indications, the signal environment can be amplified. This is very often used by warners and um, the problematic, such as the International Crisis Group, who tend to warn very late, but are then quite effective. This is not very helpful for early action, but it is very helpful for being noticed. The third finding we had is that um, receptivity, which is a key, key theoretical explanation, so in a sense how open decision makers are for warnings, uh, can vary substantially. And perhaps unsurprisingly, one of the main explanations for high or low receptivity are the interests. Uh, that uh, pre the pre-existing interests that a decision maker holds. So what would be the implications of acting in a preventive way? Um, how convenient or inconvenient is this warning? How important is this particular case? And what we found is that um, a kind of a medium level interest would be most advantageous for warning. So both a, a strong interest um, are problematic because they lead to wishful thinking. So. Uh, decision makers don't like the consequences of what preventive action would entail or the con consequences if the warning was true. But on the other hand, it would not be helpful if they didn't care about the country altogether. So if, if a country is off the radar and they wouldn't really um, start paying attention in the first place. So a moderate level of interest in the, the warning, the, the, the harm that is caused is most helpful for being uh, received. The second relevant explanation is lessons learned from recent cases. So a warning failure in one case tends to read, lead to higher sensitivity afterwards. Perhaps, again, not a, a very surprising finding. We found that um, a relatively successful preventive action in the case of Macedonia was helped by the fact that there have been a lot of previous cases of conflict in ex-Yugoslavia and then Kosovo, which looked very similar. So decision makers could easily imagine what would happen if um, the situation in Macedonia would escalate on the same trajectory. It can, however, also work in the opposite direction, as we've seen in the case of Rwanda, where uh, US decision makers had previously learned the lesson from Somalia that intervention could backfire, that it was very dangerous to do, and therefore were more resistant to taking on board uh, and responding to calls for urgent actions to stop uh, the genocide unfolding. So receptivity and lessons learned are an important explanation to when uh, to, to, to either high or low receptivity to warnings and may go some way towards explaining the cyclical nature of preventive policy, that you go from uh, being highly sensitive and perhaps even overreactive to warnings to being underreactive and, and slow to respond uh, to warnings. Now, are there any ways in which we can learn from these findings? Are there ways of closing the warning response gap? And I think our research points to three main lessons that we could learn for improving the warning response linkage. The first is to focus on the relationship between the sources of warnings and the recipients of warnings. To improve the interaction, the give them opportunities to interact more closely while strengthening the role of expertise in organizations. In the US, in the US intelligence community, there's a strong sense that intelligence analysts need to be protected from decision makers. There need to be strong institutional boundaries, professional autonomy is highly, highly valued, and, um, and blurring the lines would just lead to the politicization of intelligence. From the perspective of warning, this is a problematic decision to, uh, uh, problematic position to take. Um, first of all, um, we found, certainly in the case of Iraq, that um, these institutional boundaries are no real protection against politicization in the first place. But more importantly, they, get into, they, they build up um, technocratic silos in which analysts live, uh, 
that lead to misunderstanding of what decision makers, how decision makers tick, that hinder analysts from tailoring the warnings in a way that is most effective and for getting the timing of warnings right. It also gets in the way of, of building up credibility with decision makers if decision makers don't know who's knowledgeable, who's got a track record in a particular country. And, um, and, and, and it, it gets in the way of building a, a, a relationship between potential sources of warnings and those who are supposed to act upon them. So organizations should not create these policy uh, silos, but um, should, should find ways of um, promoting interaction and communication. There are a number of lessons that um, the sociolo sociology of risk uh, literature offers to understanding um, warning response relationships. For instance, organizations that are seen as uh, high, high reliability organizations value expertise and learning uh, rather than uh, 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 encouraging management. So there has to be a kind of a career track within organizations that is built on expertise rather than saying you can only advance if you rotate from your position every two years, losing the expertise but acquiring management experience. So certainly in diplomatic circles, this is a major problem that this expertise of countries and regions is quickly lost um, because you only advance if you change your, uh, your, your, your station every, every two years. It is also important to encourage an organization that is uh, promoting a sense of taking responsibility, also a responsibility for errors and, ex and, and, a, and a, an openness to look at organizational failures. So a sense of leadership for encouraging the reporting of errors and reward for whistleblowers can be a, a way of sending within an organization uh, uh, the message that inconvenient news will not be repressed that an organization is open to dealing with these inconvenient news that my, might embarrass the organization or might embarrass decision makers. Um, and only through encouraging these inconvenient news to be part of the process within the organization will you encourage warners to come forward. Otherwise, you get a blame-shifting culture in which warners always think about the implications of their warnings and in which the warnings would be always hatched. So in a sense, they would be formulated in a way that they are most likely to be ignored, but when something has happened, they can wave the paper and say, look, I've said it in the paragraph four on page four, uh, five, that um, this was going to happen. And that is not an effective warning process that everyone is just uh, covering their backs uh, rather than issuing a clear and effective warning. Secondly, uh, it is important to shorten the decision-making times uh, that uh, get in the way of acting early. Quite often, organizations take a long, long time until a warning goes through each level of hierarchy and until, in a sense, everyone has, been co has talked to everyone else and until the response has been perfectly coordinated, um, the situation on the ground has already changed and has become worse and uh, uh, some of the harm has already uh, occurred. So what you need to do is you need to create opportunities for acting earlier, but perhaps in a less well-coordinated fashion. The obvious way of doing that is, of course, if you merge the warning and the response function in one organization. So one of the most successful actors in preventive action uh, has been the OSCE High Commission on National Minorities, who um, has ha had a fact-finding mission, but also a mediation mission. So Hans van der Stoel in, in, in Estonia was a very, very effective actor in uh, preventing an outbreak of violence, but he was also empowered to do so by, um, the, diff by, by, by the organization of the different, different member states. He didn't have to wait until every and each member state of the OEC had given the green light, but he could act on his own accord. Similarly, it would be helpful to devolve responsibility for preventive action downwards to embassies, um, insofar as there are relatively low risk instruments involved, or to local community actors and organizations. So perhaps less effective action, but earlier action um, can help um, to respond to warnings and uh, prevent the harm from occurring. Thirdly, one has to look at the incentives for prevention. And one of the, the uh, obvious um, criticisms, um, or one of the obvious um, remedies for one of the problems I've outlined earlier, namely that too little resources are uh, available for prevention is that you have to ring fence, um, not a lot of resources, but to ring fence a certain degree of uh, organizational and policy resources 
uh, for prevention, that they are available at all time, regardless of what specific crisis is hitting the organization. Because otherwise, there's always a good reason to spend the money in the now, uh, rather than spend some of the money on preventing something that will be very costly to the organization, to voters, to citizens um, later on. So the only way of making good on the promise that preventive action is much cheaper than crisis management is to do less crisis management in the first place, to create the space for prevention uh, to work. So ring fencing is, is one response. The second response is uh, accountability. In a number of organizations, we found that there's no clear space where the warning is supposed to go to. So who is supposed to either act or not act on warning? warnings? It's perfectly legitimate for a decision maker to say, well, this warning is not important enough. There are other more important things going on. But there has to be a clear sense of who is making that decision and on, on, on what grounds. And if a warning, a very high quality warning about something that is very important and could be easily pre prevented with low risk at low cost, if that warning is not acted upon, there has to be accountability for that decision not to act. And in many organizations, there's no uh, locus for that um, accountability uh, uh, for acting or not acting on warnings. And thirdly, uh, unless you make the case that prevention pays, that prevention is worthwhile doing, you will not change the impetus, the incentives for decision makers to discount the future and to um, gain credit by being a crisis manager. So first, you need to measure success of, of prevention, and you need to publicize when prevention has been successful in order to overcome um, the tendency of the news media to focus only on the negative. And here, um, I've got a, a very nice uh, photo, which you may have seen in the newspapers. It's, it's not, it's not short-term prevention, um, but it's, it's, it's useful as a visualization of the success of prevention. So this is London. Um, two weeks ago, if there had been no investment in the Thames flood barrier. So this is how, how London would look like if the Thames flood barrier had not been built, if the, the gates had not been closed. Um, you can very easily see the consequences um, that would have um, ensued uh, and the misery it would have, would have caused and the, the, the huge economic loss it would have caused for, for the country. So, a very, a very, very uh, good investment uh, indeed in, in, in preventive action. Unfortunately, in many other areas of risk, it is not so easy to visualize uh, and, and, and demonstrate the success of uh, preventive action. But I would argue it is indispensable uh, for making the case that you need to build better warning and response systems and that uh, preventive action actually pays. What else can you do? Um, the fourth, fourth area of action, or the fourth, fourth lesson that one could learn for closing the warning response gap is that, indeed, sometimes you have to prepare for failure. You, need to, you, you have to realize that short-term prevention will sometimes not work or will be ineffective. So yes, sometimes it will have to be long-term prevention, minimizing the risk, Flooding is a good case, but also structural conflict prevention may be a good case that it is sometimes too late, six months or 12 months down the line, to issue a warning. It is too late to stop the conflict dynamics from unfolding. Um, the case of Syria may be another case where people have said, well, really, there was very little that could be done. I, I may not necessarily agree with it, but some of the conflicts, some of the risks are just too difficult to resolve in the short term. The second response is to say, well, if preventive action, short-term preventive action is not going to work, we'll need to build resilience. So this is the literature on resilience, and some of the lessons have been put in place with regard um, uh, to the financial crisis. So making sure that banks are allowed to fail without bringing the whole system down, that the system as a whole can bounce back from a shock and can uh, recover, that you're not focusing on preventing a harm, but in a sense mitigating the consequences and enabling um, actors and systems to bounce back and move back to normal as soon as possible. And lastly, indeed, it is a question of adjusting public expectations about what is 
and is not possible and what the trade-offs are. Again, using the case of the recent flooding, um, the, the head of the uh, environmental agency made the case that government uh, cost-benefit uh, ratios meant that money uh, had to, was, was always spent on cities, flood defenses in cities, rather than in rural regions. Now, this was a choice um, that was made, and one can question whether the, the values underpinning that choice are always convincing, but you can explain it to the public why a decision was taken to concentrate resources on this particular area rather than another one. So this brings me to the conclusion. So the first one is just to recap how complex a problem uh, warning response is. It requires the combination of different disciplinary approaches. It, it links the analytical problem of forecasting natural um, phenomena, man-made phenomena, industrial uh, phenomena, technological phenomena, with social scientific problems to do with persuasion, decision-making, and policy implementation. So really understanding what happens across the whole cycle is a very challenging problem indeed, and uh, I must confess uh, has confounded us a number of times because you, you have to draw on so many different uh, uh, theories to explain uh, the, the, um, the actual outcome, and everything is interlinked with everything else. Secondly, I think we need to have more realistic expectations of what we can expect from warnings. Uh, in particular, we need to become more critical in the extent to which uh, uh, we fall into hindsight bias, the extent to which we think that something was much more likely at the time than we actually than, than, than was actually realistic. And to resist the tendency to quickly allocate blame too easily without looking in detail at the cases, at the substance, at what was known at the time, what decision makers thought about particular warners, and um, not to lose sight of cases of success. So I think um, there may not be a hope for Cassandra to ever be, be listened to because being cursed is not something that uh, we can do something about as social scientists, but um, I do think that our research and the research of others into the warning response problem offers some lessons on how warners can become more effective in making their case, uh, how organizations and systems become more encouraging of warners and better at processing warnings, and while at the same time we avoid falling into some sort of cyclical pattern of underwarning, underreacting, overwarning, overreacting, and, um, and calibrate our responses to something that is more sustainable uh, and ultimately uh, effective. And with that, I think I'll conclude. I think we have just heard a very classic example of how a absolute clarity of the theoretical perspective that Christoph brings to his research um, allows us to move globally from Sudan to the drive-by warning, which is a phrase I shall take away from this lecture there, the over-the-wall warning um, that policymakers here in Britain also need to understand. Uh, I reiterate our invitation to the reception outside, but meanwhile, in the traditional way, can I invite you to thank warmly our new professor. Thank you. Thank you.